Okay, something went wrong there, but now we are resuming. So we have more stuff about what users want. Okay. <coughs> okay, so before the World Wide Web, right, think about basically before 1995 and America Online and stuff like that, internet search was a lot like searching for a particular file on a computer, right? So organizations stored data in files and folders. The search tools basically helped you locate those particular files in folders. So if you knew who the guy was who was the lead researcher on a project and what university he was at, you could probably use that information to find the data you were looking for. Okay, so matching names or types or metadata, right? Maybe if there's a guy who's a big name in his field, he has multiple research projects going on at the same time. So he'd say, oh, I think this started off in, you know, January uh, 1994. And you could dig for it that way and have a pretty good chance of getting the stuff. But World Wide Web eventually began to dominate usage, right? So it's a shift from that just raw text to pages that include a lot of objects and a lot of different formatting options. So search needed to match these terms to text and content. So problem number one is what should the factor weighting be? How important should text be to certain types of objects? And how, how important should different objects be relative to each other? Okay? The other one, simple matching models get easily broken. The big way that the bad guys would do this, once they figured out how Google search term, uh, search algorithm worked, is they just packed pages with a lot of nonsense text, right? So they'd have some, something at the top that would look like a regular web page, but the actual boundaries of the web page would be very wide and very long and just be packed with uh, text in whatever color the background color of the page was so you couldn't see it. And that's how these sites would try to rank higher in the search listings. Okay. So there were a lot of different firms, a lot of different search models uh, trying to win the great search engine war of the 90s. In the end, economies of scale, most of these uh, competitors could not survive, right? The only one that's really around as a significant entity in our half of the world is Google. I mean, yeah, there's Bing, but in my personal opinion, the only reason why Bing really exists is that uh, Google wants Bing around to avoid the appearance of uh, having a monopoly in search. I mean, there's no, does anybody use Bing except accidentally? Like you're using Edge and you type something in the bar and you're like, oh shit, I didn't mean to search for it with Bing, but I did, right? I mean, does anybody not prefer using Google? Yeah, so that's kind of my point, right? But Bing is out there, but basically it's just Google anymore. All right, so Google, the reason why uh, some articles here if you want to look at it, but Google prospered because of two things. Number one, very simple ad-free interface, right? There's basically, there's a box where you enter some text. It's hard to screw it up, okay? The other thing, this they did much better than anybody else, incorporating learning into their search model. Over time, Google uh, was able to figure out some terms are linked to other terms. Basic idea of that, return to our World War II model, one thing, Google can learn by the sequence of searches, right? So over time, Google said, you know what? People who search for World War II might follow with any others, like WW2, WW2, whatever. With enough data, Google can eventually infer that these terms are equivalent and verify by including pages matching both in the search for either and still getting clicks on those links, okay? So if somebody searches for World War II written out like that, and they get a bunch of pages, and they think about it for a while, and they come back and they do another search like that, and they click on some of those pages. Google sees enough of that going on, and Google's going to start thinking, hey, you know what, maybe the fact that somebody searched for one term, then another right after it, maybe that's worth looking into as equivalent terms for the same thing. And yeah, over time, that's what they do. And the way that they verify that they're the same is Google starts merging these two into the same search results. So basically, if you search for this, you also get the results for that, and people are roughly equally likely to click on results for one or the other, okay? All right. Right, on the other hand, 
other hand, anybody remember that one uh, movie from a few years ago, World War Z, about the zombies? World War Z, even though it looks a lot like World War II, is probably not going to show up the same pages, right? Because Z, Z is for zombies. Yeah. Okay, and Google could, you know, might try something like that, but they're going to look, oh, people that are looking for World War Z really want film stuff. People that are looking for World War II, they're looking for something else. They're not looking for zombies in most cases. Okay. So Google wants to give high quality search results, right? Basically, it wants to give you the pages that best match what you're looking for, best and most popular results. And this encourages people to use Google, encourages them to keep coming back for more. What Google wants to do is get scale. It gets scale by providing a good service, which brings people coming back. So as Google's getting bigger, getting more traffic, the other search engines are starting to starve themselves off, right? But what does Google need? It needs money to keep that going. Right, because if you are getting very big and you have this ad, this ad model where basically you're not running ads, how is that even going to work? Right, that you get lots more network traffic. It's just costing you more and more and more to do your work. So, one thing that people fell into in the '90s was something called paid inclusion. Okay, Google mostly didn't do this, although there's some borderline cases. So, ideally. Right? What you want to do is be able to provide relevant results that are at least as good as what a human could provide you. Right? So relevant results provided by a human-like site and an uh, analysis program. Basically, you get at least as good of results as a human would give you, but you get it orders of magnitude faster. The other one that's a possibility is preferentially ranking sites that are willing to pay some kind of advertising premium. And that might sound skeevy off the bat, but there is some legitimacy to it. Right. The one thing that's good about that is it tends to push down spam blog results, basically garbagey sites. The thing is, if you have enough money that you're willing to pay for getting listed high in the ads, you are probably a legitimate company. It's not a guaranteed thing, but, you know, yeah, this is a pretty good chance that you're a legit company and the fact that you're willing to pay more to get traffic indicates that you probably have quality content. But the bad side of that is the search results don't reflect the true relevance, right? Remember. We want to do this. Google wants to give you the best search results. And the fact that somebody's willing to pay more to get listed doesn't necessarily mean that the search results are the best. Now, Google generally avoids this kind of paid inclusion. Uh, Google has a bunch of different ways you can search. The one that's kind of a borderline case is uh, if you use basically Google's uh, shopping uh, feature, sometimes some of those uh, retailers, they'll show up higher on the listings depending on how much they have uh, business they've done with Google over the recently. So it's not strictly speaking, they're paying money to get ranked higher, but Google has more information on them. And because of that, they do tend to get ranked higher. Uh, but mostly Google search results, Google does not pay for those. Okay, and Google does not accept payment. So what happens is this, the basic model, search results, based entirely on Google's assessment of relevance, not on any dollars, right? That's what you'll mostly see on the page, but there could be ads around it, right? We know this on Google. You do a search result, there could be ads here, ads here, some ads over here on the side, whatever. Okay, so this part here, the search results, yeah, the search results are all, you know, what they call pure. They haven't accepted any money to get ranked higher. But all around the periphery, right, Google will run ads, and those ads will be labeled as such, will be either ad or sponsored. <laughs> so if we go to Google, for example, uh, what shall we look? Some, what's something that people buy? Socks. Okay, so I do socks for sale. Sponsored, right? There's ads. The thing that actually shows up at the top listing, Macy's. How about that? All right. Amazon's a little lower, whatever. I scroll down below, I find some more ads, whatever, links to Google Maps. But there's not a lot of money in socks, so there's not a whole lot of ads. Let's do something else. What, uh, what tops? 
the Google Lab Test, boom, there's a bunch of ads there. Here's, you can see in green there is a little circle ad from the Microsoft Surface people, Dell laptops. I scroll down to the bottom, there might be some more. No, uh, maybe. A lot of, okay. All right, so depending on what you're searching for, yeah, these search results are always going to be pure, but there might be more or less ads around them. You can even come up with some terms that generally do not have any ads. Eagles is one of the ones that, right? Eagles. I do not have anything about eagles as far as ads. I could probably find another one. If I look like tungsten, I get ads for that? Oh, freaky. All right. Yeah, I'm just going to go down to the store and buy like a couple pounds of tungsten. Cool. All right. So that's fun. Okay. So key point, key takeaway, Google search listings are pure. They don't accept money for people to pay, you know, to get their site ranked higher in the listings. But there's a whole system for how people can run ads along with the search results. And those, yeah, depending on how much money you've given Google, your ad could be shown in a better position. Okay. Now, way back when, <coughs> way back when, like 1996 or so, the people who were working on Google, uh, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, they had this idea, more important sites had more links. If you were a big site, you tended to link to more other sites. And basically, they came up with a model based on the probability that a random person randoming around the web would end up on your site. So basically, how many pages you had, how many links to it, that would all drive, you know, average random traffic to your site. Okay? So, unfortunately, this was correlation, not causation. So, around 1996, 1998, this model actually worked pretty well because people hadn't been thinking too much about ways to game the system. What Google did, if a page had a high page rank, right, basically indicating that it belongs to a big site or a page that has more links, whatever, it tends to rank higher in search listings. Then it worked pretty well. The downside, number one, it's pretty easy to manipulate the rankings, right? One of the easy things you can do, just pack your page with a lot of different links. Another thing you can do is make sites of entire, you know, large numbers of junky pages all packed with many links. And then your site will eventually rank higher just based on the page rank. The other thing, it also tends to excessively favor older and more developed sites, right? If you're like a site that only has a few pages, there's no way you can really compete with a big site that has hundreds of pages, even though the quality of information on yours might be slightly higher, right? Basically, Google has to include something extra on that, basically how many, custom, how many visitors keep coming back to your site, some, some kind of learning. Because if it's just doing this, then the big sites are always going to win. Okay. Now, for a long window from the late 90s to the early aughts, right, the first decade of this century, uh, somewhere around 2006, 2008, Google started to do a very good job of fighting this problem. Until then, we had a lot of trouble with spam blogs, or sometimes called splogs. So, a spam blog is basically a way that you can make money online without really having any good content. So number one, you pack your site with popular search terms to draw traffic. So basically any search that comes up, there's a good chance that your site might be included in it. And a lot of that was hidden from the visitors, right? You use these big oversized pages or you hide terms behind images, stuff like that. The other thing, well, you still got to make money, right? You're not really selling anything. You don't have any good content. What do you want to do? You want to have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ads. And the idea is, hopefully somebody, when they come to the page, they accidentally click on an ad and you get paid. That's what these sites were trying to do. Now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, these were very common search result clutter. Okay, you do some random search about something, there'd be a lot of these spam blog type pages. But there's been a drift over time. Google's gotten pretty good at detecting pages that have like no worthwhile content at all. But ones that are kind of junky, like a lot of clickbait, yeah, those are the ones that tend to have taken over that role. So they have junky content. It might be kind of fun sometimes, but you know, it's not really very serious. Yeah, that's what you see now. So spam blogs peaked about 10 years ago. And how did Google defeat them? Well, number one, more sophisticated site analysis. Not just looking at the number of search terms or the number of links or the number of pages. Google actually looked at how the page was constructed in some sense. And especially, an easy thing, if a page has lots and lots and lots and lots of ads and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of text, and a lot of that text tends to be fairly high ranking on the popularity meter at Google, 
Google's smart enough to say, oh yeah, you know what? That's kind of a garbagey page. We're not gonna we're not gonna link to that. Okay, and of course, user feedback is an option. I can give you an example if it's still working. The one I always used to do, Doug Lundquist, IDS 355, UIC, Fall 2011. This used to be a good link. If I go down to the end of the results, I used to be able to get some spam blog nonsense with this. Although lately it's been getting harder and harder to find. This is pretty good. Here's a garbage page. Ah. All right, so here's some, something in French, blah, 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 blah. I don't know why it's linking me here, but you can see what's linked here as far as the text. World Happiness 2011, Wow Wow, English, Phineas, C, Ferb, 220, Pictures of the Singer from Falling in Reverse, Holt, Math Book, Algebra. You get the idea, right? This is not really a coherent set of sentences. This is a bunch of junky uh, detail that they've put somewhere, and then it links directly to it. Uh, but like I said, this one, you can see when I logged into this page, it jumped ahead from where I ever was and like auto forwarded it to that. So anyway, spam blogs still kind of exist, but they're harder and harder to find. All right. So what does Google do? Well, it has to continuously monitor web pages. It wants to return current and high quality search results. Sometimes content is inherently dynamic, right? So things like today's weather, today is always changing. Other things, static changes to static data, right? You might have a page that has a bunch of text, some uh, site, you know, the site owner comes along and edits the text somehow, puts in some new features, whatever. Yeah, it's static data, but they changed it. And of course, some pages get created and deleted all the time. So all of those are gonna affect Google's algorithms. Ultimately, Google has to store a pretty current replica of the entire surface internet. Basically, all the pages you can get to without any sort of special access credentials. Now, even 10 years ago, Google was looking at a trillion pages several times a day. This was like a big thing that they did, okay? It's a big data problem. Looking at that many pages, gathering the data, comparing it to what's changed, crunching the numbers, recomputing re the site rankings, all that is a big work, a big lot of work. Okay, what are we doing slide-wise? Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about this and then perhaps, eh, we'll see how we go, I'll go for a little while. Okay, so the search operations consists of basically three things. This is what Google does internally. First, crawling. Crawling is basically looking at the pages and extracting the relevant data from them. Second one is indexing. Indexing is basically take this data and figure out how to store it somewhere so you can easily access it later, right? I mean, they could just take all this data and throw it in some kind of digital garage, but then it would be tough to find. But Google wants to be able to find stuff after they've searched it and put it away. So they have to have a fairly orderly system for managing that. And last, retrieval, right? Anytime a search uh, query comes in, Google's gonna figure out which pages match it best. Like for some very popular term like sports, there might be 22 billion matches. Google has to somehow prioritize which one of those makes the most sense to show you. Okay, so there's some very brief very brief articles there, but we'll talk a little more. All right. <coughs> so Google has software agents that visit pages and gather links and other kinds of data. And these agents are called crawlers or spiders. Okay, that's what they are. They're basically little automated browser programs that random around the web looking at different pages. After a page gets visited, this crawler is also going to visit any pages that that one is linked to. And the idea is, you know, if you follow this trail of links, eventually you'll be able to search every page that's linked to every other page, okay? The eventual result, Google has not only all the pages, but also a graph of the entire conventional internet, basically how all these pages are connected to each other. So when I say the conventional internet, I mean not the dark web, which is something you may have heard about on these, you know, TV shows. Okay, how it gets updated, well, every now and then Google schedules a repeat visit to check for page changes. And it's based on basically how often Google thinks the site is gonna change and what kind of uh, mileage Google's gonna get out of that check. So if it's a very popular page, it comes up in search a lot, Google's gonna check it at pretty short intervals because it wants to deliver high quality results. If it's a page that only gets visited, you know, once a month by anybody, it's a very unvisited page, very sad and lonely page, 
then Google's not going to bother checking it that much either because what would be the point, right? You make one person a little bit happier once a month, it's just not worth it. Other stuff, reliability, right? How often is the page up and available? Because one of the signs of a junky page is that they don't maintain it well or they don't pay the bill to keep it hosted wherever. And update frequency. Some pages get updated a lot, some pages get interrupted, updated at long intervals, right? So for example, if it's a blog, chances are people are writing these blog articles, once they're done, right, they get stuffed into some, uh, you know, repository and not really updated. What gets updated is whatever's on that front page. So here's today's new article, okay? But the stuff in the archives, Google's not gonna check that very often. Okay. So what's the tech? Like I said, a Googlebot, Googlebot is what Google calls its spiders. A Googlebot is basically a browser that vis visits pages and copies their content. So Googlebot doesn't do any processing besides reading content and checking the links. Basically, it looks at the page, essentially downloads all of that content to Google's indexing system, and then it visits other pages based on the links that are there, okay? Delivers the content to Google's indexing system. Now, one of the things that these pages can have is something called a robots.txt file. Robots.txt specifies any content that spiders should ignore. A good example of where that's necessary Imagine if you have a page, you have some article about, I don't know, some news article about, let's say the Chicago Cubs, okay? And down below, so blah, blah, blah. And down below, comments, right? And so there's comment, whatever, you know. Joe says, Cubs suck. Fred says, nah, -uh, and so on, right? So the idea with this, you want to search, have search engines rank the page just based on this news article. You don't want it to have it ranked based on whatever these clowns are saying in the comments. That's a silly thing to have the Google uh, people rank the page on. So basically, you're going to include this, say, you know, robots.txt, no comments. And you say, yeah, anything here on, right, this comment stuff, don't come, don't, don't include that as part of your search process. That's stuff that is not, you know, core to the page itself. Other things you might not include is like third-party ads, right? You have a page, it has some content, there's some ad in the margin. You don't want your site ranked according to using that ad either. Okay. All right, I guess we'll cover, yeah, we'll just do the quick stuff. Retrieval, I'm thinking about how far we're gonna go. Maybe we'll just call it a day after I would talk about indexing briefly. Okay, so a few more slides. So number one, we'll talk about deep web versus dark web, okay? The deep web is a perhaps surprisingly large portion of the web, stuff that's not indexed by search engines, okay? So either permission denied in robots.txt files, or hidden behind paywalls. For example, you can only see this content if you pay our $9.99 a month subscription fee. Or secured content, right? Like email accounts, financials, private social media pages, anything like that that Google doesn't have access to look at. That all stuff is what's called the deep web. Now the dark web is something else. The dark web is part of the web that's designed explicitly for anonymous usage, right? It's a small part of the deep web often associated with criminal activity. Have you guys heard of Silk Road? Yeah? What do we know about Silk Road? It's okay, you can say it. Yeah, you could. Or buy drugs, whatever, yeah. You could do a lot of criminal things on Silk Road, yeah. So there's an interesting story here. Uh, there was a movie from the late 80s called uh, The Princess Bride, and there was a bad dude in that called the Dread Pirate Roberts that this guy picked as his persona, like the, basically the, effectively the CEO of Silk Road. The article is very interesting because it talks about how they caught him. And if we had more time, I would, you know, go through the whole back and forth about it. But I'll just tell you what it is. They, they said, huh, here we have somebody who's in an anonymous part of the internet. We have no idea of figuring out who he is. And we have, you know, no real leads to get to him. How would we go about figuring that out? Well, 
some smart people at the FBI said, you know what, anything that's on the dark web, if they're going to sell stuff, they still got to advertise somehow. So what we should look for is the very first advertisements about Silk Road and try to figure out who posted them on non-dark web pages. And basically that's what they did, because they said, you know what, the guy who posts those leads to Silk Road, if he's not the CEO, he's probably one of the CEO's buddies. So they went back several years, found very early ones on a message board where some guy said, hey, you should check this stuff out. You can buy all kinds of drugs and it's great quality and safe. And yeah, and that's how they took him down. They caught him in a library somewhere. I don't know. That's the story. Okay, so that was the dark web, that was Silk Road, whatever. Uh, you might have heard of Tor browsers. Uh, Tor is basically a mechanism for allowing anonymous internet, uh, access, internet access through onion routing. Basically, every time you go from one site to the next, your history gets scrambled up. So it's really hard to trace where people came from. And the other side of that, they have I2P, which is a mechanism for anonymous website hosting. So basically, anything you do on there is anonymized, and any content that's being served up is likewise anonymized. Interestingly, it wasn't a bunch of criminals that set up this dark web in the first place. The people who actually built this was the US government, our espionage services, I believe the CIA. They said, you know what, we have agents all over the world. It would be nice if they could use the internet without compromising their identity or whatever. And so, yeah, they came up with this mechanism for doing it. And then of course, it's also very good for criminal stuff. Okay. Okay, just a couple more slides. So indexing. All the pages that Google has visited get stored in this internet scale database system, right? Basically, remember, Google essentially has to store a copy of the surface internet. And in fact, with needing to store multiple copies, basically they're keeping a triple copy of the internet. Uh, what do they include? Well, text, various ways that it gets looked at, images and videos, at least the metadata, right? But Google does retain all the original copies of all the pages. And other metadata from the page, like when it was created, when it was last revised, that Google uses to schedule return visits by spiders. So, main repository is kept on a whole stack, giant stack of uh, document servers, right? And the sorting details, how the pages all get arranged and stored and kept, that's part of Google's special sauce. You're not going to find details about how they do that. All right. So. <coughs> But let's give a, a quick insight to this. We'll have more uh, detail on indexing in the next lecture about indexing, uh, indexing and retrieval. But for now, imagine this. Suppose you have a library full of books and you need to find information on some topic. You wouldn't scan every book to find matches, right? You wouldn't go through the whole library and say, oh, let's check this first book, let's check this second book, let's check the third, third book. Because if you're gonna search more than once, that's a lot of wasted effort. Instead, you're going to build an index to guide you to a much smaller subset, right? So whatever the topic is, you consult the index for that topic and you look, oh, only books 4, 5, 12, and 208 actually have any information on that. We'll check those. Okay? It saves a lot of time. And it's basically the same thing at Google. So when people do a search, right, Google has all of these groups of pages linked by index entries. Basically, here's a page about sports, here's a page about money, here's a page about UIC, whatever. Google has all that stuff already pre-sorted, so when people are searching on those topics, Google can very quick, you know, in like half a second, deliver a bunch of search results. So for every search term, the index holds a giant list of pages containing the term. And of course, if you have multiple search terms, relatively small set of web pages will hold them. But still, searches for common terms easily return several million matches, right? So if I do something like, let's do a quick one. Cubs game today. I don't know if there is a Cubs game today. Just Cubs game today gives 237 million results. Okay? That's kind of crazy. You don't want to have to search through all that. All right. All right. This seems like a good place to break off because we're going to talk uh, more about stuff in detail with indexing, so I kind of want to leave that separate. Any questions on any of this stuff? Nothing? You are a silent group. All right. Well, then this seems...